All right, let's start. At the turn of the century, the 1900s, it was the age of the hourglass. And you can see by looking at this woman's incredible body, and then at the hourglass next to her, you can see why it is known as the age of the hourglass in terms of fashion. All right, let's look at the world of the 1900s. We saw it starting, right, when we did the 1890s. Remember the gay 90s and how the world changed because of this. Electricity. Well, electricity would be even more widespread at the turn of the century. Electricity lit up the home. It lit up the night. It lit up the world. People could travel around because of electricity on electric tram cars. It was when the first subway started to appear. And at the turn of the century, we see the car increasingly gaining momentum and overtaking the horse. And aeroplanes. My goodness, what a modern world it was. Telephones were seen in more and more homes as well. So you can see this world really isn't that different to our own. This is the Edwardian era. Remember that word, know that word and know what it means. Edwardian. And it is given this name because of this guy. King Edward VII of England. And there he is with that rather spectacular beard. We can use the word Edwardian to describe things that aren't English. We can talk about the Edwardian period in terms of American architecture, for example. And this is Edwardian style. And of course, we'll examine this in much more detail in a second. Although Edward VII died in 1910, the term Edwardian is often extended to include the years leading up to World War I, which began in 1914. So really the first 15 years or so of the 20th century is known as the Edwardian period. Never ever confuse Edwardian with Victorian, like 99% of the population seem to. All right, like we're going to do with every decade, let's start with the 1900s body ideal. Every decade had its own ideal body. And of course, the relationship between fashion ideals and the ideal body is symbiotic. So here she is. This is the ideal body of the Edwardian era. Elegant, tall, long neck, full bosom, very full bosom, a tiny waist and full hips. Did anyone actually have this body? Well, this lucky lady did. We'll look at her later. Look at that tiny waist. This is also known as a wasp waisted body, a wasp waist. That is a wasp to remind you what a wasp looks like. It's not like a little round chubby bumblebee. A wasp is made of these two bulbous halves and there is the wasp's waist. And she is wasp waisted. Right, I just mentioned the symbiotic relationship between fashion and the ideal body. Well, let's see it play out. This is how it played out. And if we put the right hat on her, you can see that this is the silhouette of the first 10 years of the 20th century. But how did women achieve this incredible shape? Well, with corsetry. This really is the age of the extreme corsets, the first 10 years or so of the 20th century. This is a newspaper ad or a magazine ad. And you can see, look, all of the exclusive designs. Large sales have proven it to be the best domestic corset. So. They're all slightly different, but they all achieve the same shape, as you can see. Every woman wore a corset. If you didn't wear a corset, you were like slovenly. 
There was something wrong with you. You were mentally deranged if you didn't wear a corset. It was so improper not to. But of course you wanted to because you wanted to have that body. And corsets worked. Here, this is a, a contemporaneous image of a woman without her corset on. And then look out how her waist changes with a corset. And just to give you that visual again, without a corset and with a corset, they worked. They worked a little too well for some people, though. There are always people who take things to the extreme. Um, ouch. But check her out. Now, what I find interesting about this picture on the uh, left, I think it's been altered. It's been doctored. They didn't have Photoshop in those days, obviously, but you could certainly um, manipulate an image. And I think that this image has been manipulated to give her this ridiculously tiny waist. I don't think a human being could have a waist that, that small. But what's interesting is that you can see right here, you know, uh, more than a hundred years ago, at the turn of the 20th century, women were being fed unrealistic ideals, weren't they? Just like when we look at all those photoshopped images of perfect size zero models with uh, uh, perfect bodies and no cellulite. It's been photoshopped, right? This is early photoshopping. And you can see that, wow, women have been fed these false ideals that we're all supposed to be living up to for a very long time. There were other ways, however, along with your corset, uh, that women would try to achieve the kind of waist that you see in these two pictures. There was a craze at the turn of the century for ingesting tapeworm eggs. You would ingest the egg, the tapeworm would hatch, um, and it would grow in your intestine. And it would eat a great deal of the food that you were eating. So you got thinner and thinner, so you could get a tiny little waist like this, but you didn't want to lose your boobs and you didn't want to lose your bum. So a lot of women did pad out their fronts. Um, anyway, the tapeworm would grow inside you. And this is a human tapeworm at full length. Look at that ruler down there, that's 12 inches. So this is several feet long. Um, yes, this would be growing and living inside you. It would be your little friend to carry around with you. Evidently, when you are infested with a tapeworm, you have horrible breath and constant diarrhea. Once you decided you wanted to get rid of your little friend, there were uh, a couple of very unpleasant ways to do it, equally unpleasant. You could go to the drugstore and get a medicine that would kill it instantly. Um, but tapeworms, they, they're difficult to kill. So you would have to keep taking the medicine until you were sure that the tapeworm was dead. And the only way to be sure, every time you went to the bathroom to have a poo, you would have to put on gloves and go through your own feces until you found the head of the tapeworm because only then did you know that you were rid of your tapeworm. I have to show you now an image much much magnified of a tapeworm's head. That's a tapeworm's head and you see it has these little hooks and they're the hooks that hooked into a woman's intestine and uh, oh it's far too unpleasant, isn't it? So let's let's put a face on our little tapeworm here, make her a little bit a little bit friendlier. There she is. That's your little tapeworm. Oh my God! It's so awful. I have no idea whether or not these women <laughs> ingested tapeworms, but they are certainly wearing corsets. And look at how extraordinary their bodies are. And as I mentioned earlier, this body would be enhanced not only with corsets, but often with a, a padded bosom. And here is a cartoon, a little postcard cartoon from the era, where that sort of school mommy, flat-chested lady is saying, I could throw a swell front too if I had a 
padded, if I added padding. Uh, I love that thrower swell front, i.e. have a big bosom, and then that lovely curvy lady says, ha, huh, that's what they all say. Moving on to the 1900s beauty ideal. Again, we'll do this every decade. This was the ideal feminine beauty of the turn of the century, and she was completely invented. She is called the Gibson Girl, and she was invented by this man, Charles Dana Gibson. Charles Dana Gibson was an American illustrator, and he invented this woman, and she would appear in fashion magazines and advertising, and this is another view of her. I just mentioned he was an American, right? So this is our first American international beauty ideal. Come on, prior to, to the 20th century, we were looking, oh, at beauties of the Italian Renaissance, or Elizabeth I, or French people. Suddenly, we have an American beauty ideal. And this is what she looked like. She was sort of snooty looking, a little bit snooty, um, with this uh, uh, very beautiful face, these sort of heavy, heavy eyes, slightly downward cast, and this incredible hairdo. It has a name, it's called a cottage loaf hairdo, and there we go, a cottage loaf, and this is a cottage loaf. It was a type of bread that was popular um, at the turn of the century. You can still get it today. It's sort of a, a mound of round bread with another knot of bread on top, and you can see it sort of echoes this hairdo, doesn't it? And this was the look that women strove to achieve, like these two ladies having tea. They are Gibson girls come to life. But this beauty has said it was across the board. This is how everybody wanted to look and everybody tried to look this way. We see it played out again and again and again. So how was it achieved? This is the first time we're going to be meeting our pretty Fresh-faced, makeupless girl here. Well, makeup wasn't uh, very, very popular at the turn of the century. Women just wore a little bit of rouge. And then, of course, they'd have their incredible cottage loaf hairdo, which they would often decorate with feathers and combs and things like that. So it was a very, very natural look, and you can see it here. And here, and here is a contemporary fashion image, which is obviously referencing the Gibson girl and the turn of the century ideal. And here on the runway, and here again, this is why you need to know your fashion history no matter what you decide to do in fashion. Every era we're going to be looking at style icons, and this is our first style icon. The woman we saw at the beginning with this incredible wasp-waisted hourglass figure, her name was Miss Camille Clifford, and she was an actress. Um, she was Belgian originally, but she made it big in New York. She made it big, but her waist was small. Like this. What an incredible figure. And there is another picture. She is the Gibson girl, isn't she? With that snooty look, the cottage loaf hair, and those uh, slightly uh, uh, sort of heavy downward cast eyes. And also she is um, throwing a swell front there, isn't she? Every era we're going to look at the dominant fashion idea. And here is the dominant fashion idea for the first 10 years of the 20th century. And there she is in a lovely turn of the century setting. Let's break it down. A very, very large, much adorned hat, a long, equally adorned dress. And these dresses were very long. 
especially formal dresses. I should note that for running around in everyday life, skirts were getting a little shorter and more practical, but this was the high fashion ideal still. And this very cinched waist. Basically, the world was moving much too quickly at the turn of the century. So fashion clung on to old ideas about adornment being equal to status. The more stuff you had on you, the more fashionable you were. Modernity, urbanization, and the new technology made women cling to these ultra-feminine fashion ideals and to clothing that was totally inappropriate for a world of cars and trams and very soon aeroplanes. And yet, clung on they did look at these pictures look at how incredibly uncomfortable and strange it must have been to get into a subway dressed like this let alone go to a beach dressed like this this hourglass sort of sinuous ideal was really informed by the dominant aesthetic of the era, which was called Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau was a movement in art and architecture and interior design uh, and textiles and everything really that began in fact uh, in the late 1800s but would really come to fruition and world dominance at the beginning of the 20th century. Art Nouveau was all about swirling, sinuous, curvilinear shapes. Um, it was a return to nature in this increasingly dominant world. It was a return to Anglo-Saxon, Celtic, Carolinian ideals. Remember, we did all that already. Or lots of swirling kind of stuff like this chair here it's incredible isn't it so uh, organic it looks like it's growing and this is an electric table lamp but take a look at that swirling shape in the form of a lily and of course in graphic art look at this uh, ad here this is an ad for cigarettes and look at that hair it's like the roots of a tree or the branches of a tree isn't it and this is done by Mooka this is a name that you should know in association with Art Nouveau Mooka was the greatest Art Nouveau commercial artist and he was very famous for painting these rather haughty looking girls with this incredible flowing sinuous hair and these kind of uh, pseudo medieval uh, dresses. So think about the uh, the principles of Art Nouveau, and then let's take a look at a fashion image from the era. And you'll see that really, what it does is speak to this obsession with curves. And think about the cottage loaf hair again this obsession with swirls and curls because fashion is not an island ah, you know the rest well the sands of the hourglass start to shift when we get to about 1907-1908 to this shape still very corseted but you can see it's slightly different. This is called the pigeon breast because it looks like a pigeon in this S shape with the uh, chest stuck out like a pigeon's breast and then the butt stuck out at the back. Here, ask for our new Paris sh uh, shape, straight front, extreme low bust and long hip. These were known as the safety corsets because it was believed that they were better for your internal organs than the hourglass corset that we saw at the turn of the century. The safety corsets, they, they don't look very safe to me. And here is a contemporaneous diagram showing the before and after effects of an old style corset and the new figure. It's so ridiculous. But again, it's really got that Art Nouveau curve, that sort of curvilinear shape, doesn't it? 
And there it is, in a photograph, again. What an odd way to want to look, and yet it's strangely graceful. And you will note that in the advertising, in the diagram, and in this photograph, all of these ladies have the cottage loaf hair. As does she. Now, I think it's about time we, we talked about those incredible huge hats. They were called cartwheel hats. And here are two ladies wearing these massive cartwheel hats. And they're called cartwheel hats because they're the shape of a cartwheel. These hats were enormous. Remember, during this era, people were still clinging to the idea that the more stuff you had, the bigger it was. The more stuff you put on top of it, the more fashionable you were. Wow, that is a big hat. Sometimes these hats would weigh up to 50 pounds. Feathers are heavy when taken in a huge, huge heap. And look at that. Now, she would have been considered incredibly fashionable because she had such a huge hat. And doesn't she look like Helena Bonham Carter? I've just noticed that. Let's look at the Edwardian palette. This is going to be one of our continuums palette. It was very soft, very feminine. Lilac was one of the big colors, like in this dress here. Soft, dusty rose pink, uh, ivory, very feminine colors, very soft pastels. The dominant high fashion look. There we go. It was all about embellishment. I think I've made that clear, haven't I? And here are some examples of just how ridiculous it got. So if we take this lady wearing a very simple and very beautiful vintage dress, she looks great, but she wouldn't be considered very fashionable. So shall we make her fashionable? Shall we get her ready to go to Ascot or to walk up and down Fifth Avenue? Well, first of all, we have to give her cottage loaf hair. And then lots and lots and lots of lace and lots of bows and more bows and more embroidery and more lace. Oh, and some artificial flowers. That would be nice, wouldn't it? And a train. And a big cartwheel hat, but uh, it's a little bit unfashionable still. So let's add as much crap as we possibly can and give her a parasol. Parasols were the accessory for fashionable ladies. But obviously with hats this size, they were not used to protect a woman from the sun. Can you guess what they were used for? I'll give you a second to think about it. I think you've guessed. They were to help her balance as she walked. Imagine you are walking around with a hat that weighs, oh my God, it could weigh 10 pounds, 20 pounds, up to 50 pounds of ostrich feather on your head. You've got this weird tight corset on. Also, your dress, although it's made with, you know, very beautiful lace in a very light palette, it's going to be heavy. So think about a tightrope walker using a pole to help him balance. These very fashionable Edwardian ladies would use a parasol. And here it is. My goodness, what an extraordinary way to look. Do you know there were species of birds that became extinct in the Edwardian era simply because they were killed off to decorate fashionable ladies' hats? But you couldn't dress like that in one of these. That would be ridiculous. Um, so fashion responded, as it always does, with new kind of clothing just for motoring. Now, most cars at the turn of the century, now you have to remember only very wealthy people have cars, and they didn't really know what to do with them. They just went out for drives. Um, most cars didn't have a roof on them, and so... Ladies had to dress in a way that would keep the dust from the road off their clothing. And this sort of coat was invented. And it was called 
a duster, and we still call them dusters, don't we? And look at her goggles, and also her big motoring scarf. There was a whole new realm of retail that caters just for clothing to drive in. Look at this, Gamages, the leading motor tailors, every comfort for winter motoring. And veils and motor, scar motor scarves, like you see in this uh, ad here, were all the rage for the fashionable set when they went motoring. Like this. She's using it, as you can see there, this huge scarf to help keep her rather huge hat on. And take a look at this. That's creepy. Her veil is all over her face, and then she has her goggles on. And here is a contemporary take on the turn of the century duster. But really, the big story of uh, the Edwardian era was probably the shirt waist. Basically, a shirt waist was a blouse, and everybody, everybody wore shirt waists. You would always wear your shirt waist with a skirt like this. It was long. It was made out of a sensible uh, textile, like wool, for example, or tweed, something like that, always in dark colors. Why? So it was durable. It was heavy. It was durable. You didn't have to launder it so often. But your blouse, your shirt waist, as it was known, that could be laundered more frequently to keep you fresh. Everybody, everybody wore shirt waists. You know those really high fashion ladies that we looked at a few minutes ago with their long lacy dresses with artificial roses all over them? When they were at home bossing their servants around, they would wear this outfit, the shirt waist with the long heavy skirt. A yard of Priscilla shirt waist designs. They were a craze. People loved them and everybody owned them. And they were always white, or ivory or cream. Everybody would have shirt waists. And uh, if you look at this image on the right here, often uh, the skirt and the jacket, it would be one with a little jacket, would match, but not always. So really, this is the start of separates as we know them, but often it would be like a suit. Everybody wore shirt waists. I would have had one. You would have had one. A shirt waist is what you would have worn going to school, for example. This was for practical, everyday uh, use. And please note that every single lady that I've shown you in this drop has a cottage loaf hairdo. There was a time, believe it or not, when people followed fashion's rules. So who made these shirt waists? There was such a frenzy for them. Well, do you remember in our last lecture when we looked at the uh, immigrant experience uh, in terms of the 19th century? Well, we discussed, didn't we, the conditions in those sweatshops? These are the folk who made the shirt waist, and I'm sure you know what I'm going to talk about now. I am sure you have heard of the Triangle Shirt Waist Factory disaster. A terrible fire. It's called the Triangle Shirt, Shirt Waste Factory uh, Fire or the uh, Triangle Factory Fire. It's very famous and you should know about it in terms of fashion and everything. Well, there was such a frenzy for shirt waists. There were factories, very bad conditions all over the place, especially in New York. And this is where the Triangle Shirt Waste Factory was. And um, it was located on uh, the 10th floor, I believe, of this building here. You can see the firefighters trying to put it out. And this is when electricity, this new invention, which was so wonderful in so many ways, failed to work. Um, the only way to get up and down was in the elevator. And the fire, it was started by uh, somebody throwing a match from a cigarette. They lit a cigarette and then they threw their match without extinguishing it properly into um, a bin full of discarded scraps of fabric. It caught on fire. The factory was completely full of uh, really young women working there, girls between the ages of, of sort of 15 and 25. 
A few of them, a few dozen, managed to get out via the elevator while it was still working. However, the elevator stopped working when the fire really took hold and the fire escape didn't go all the way down to the ground. So look at this headline, it's so sad. 150 perish in factory fire. Women and girls trapped in 10-story building, lost in flames, or hurled themselves to death. Many of them just threw themselves out of the window rather than being burnt alive, sort of like in 9-11. And look at that terrible photograph of those girls. You know, just girls your age. It's so terribly sad. But because of the Triangle Shirtwaist uh, Factory Fire, very strict laws were imposed, imposed is the wrong word, were brought about about health and safety in the workplace, uh, emergency exits, building codes, fire escapes, all of that stuff that we still adhere to today. So whenever we have a fire drill at school and we think, oh God, here we go again, another fire drill, we've all got to schlep out. Think about those poor girls. They died so that we'd be safe, so let's go cheerfully, right? when we go out on the fire drill. The designer of the decade, another continuum of course as we The designer of the decade this time is Lucille. Actually, Lady Lucy Duff Gordon. She was an English aristocrat and a very famous fashion designer. Look at her there, she's really trying for that Gibson look, isn't she? This is her sketchbook, and you can see she very much adhered to the ideals of the day. She wasn't very innovative, she was just very famous. And this is one of her dresses. It's very, very pretty. And here is another. Look at the palette. As time went on, she did actually become a little bit more innovative and a little bit more dramatic. This is a, a Lucille, that was the name that she worked under Lucille, a uh, gown from the 1910s. And you can see it's particularly beautiful and quite dramatic. And this is Lucille, Lady Duff Gordon, on the deck of a boat. In the 1910s, you see the silhouette has changed a little bit. And Lady Duff Gordon doesn't just belong to fashion story. She belongs to another rather epic story that you just may have heard of. What boat do you think she is on the deck of there? The Titanic. Lucy Duff Gordon and her husband were on the Titanic. Yet she survived. There she is. She's the lady on the uh, left. She was one of those uh, upper class, upper deck. Uh, people who got into the lifeboats. I'm sure you've all seen the movie Titanic. Well, Lady Duff Gordon got into quite a bit of trouble and had to go to court because evidently she was in a lifeboat with her husband and some other poshies, these upper deck people. The lifeboat was half empty, but apparently she and her husband bribed the sailors who were, you know, manning the boat uh, to not go back and pick up more survivors. Uh, Duff Gordon on stand denies on oath that either he or his wife protested against lifeboat returning to rescue. The story is that um, they paid the, the uh, sailors five pounds each and there was like three of them so that's 15 pounds and they were rich so that was nothing but quite a bit of money in its time uh, to poor sailors to not turn back which is quite disgusting isn't it but there we go lady duff gordon famous in fashion and famous in the tale of the titanic too let's look at edwardian gents here they are very dapper not really that much different to what we saw in the late 19th century are they but take a look at this here we see the bowler hat 
we see the bowler hat come into full force. But basically, what have we got here? We've got the trouser, the waistcoat, the uh, uh, collared shirt, the tie, and the jacket. It's Charles II's clothing rules, isn't it? But you know what? There's a lot more you can learn. And if you would like to learn more about Edwardian male fashion, take menswear with Professor Cockle. It's a wonderful course that really gets into the, the nitty-gritty of menswear through the ages. Well, Edwardian romance lives on. Here are some runway images that I think really speak to the Edwardian fashion aesthetic. <laughs> 